Okay, Takato, uh, are you ready? Yep. Okay, great. Oh, can I start then? Uh, I need the permission to record. Oh, sorry, you did it. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, turning up at uh, this uh, unusual time. Uh, so this week, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Takato Yoshimura from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. They will talk about the uh, TT bar deform conformance in theories out of equilibrium. So please, Takato. All right, so uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's a great pleasure that I can talk to you all about <clears throat> my recent work. Um, I think uh, we didn't quite have this kind of uh, um, journal club when I was at King's like a couple of years ago. So yeah, it's great that you, you guys came up with this uh, great um, idea. Um, right, so this work is based on my uh, recent collaboration with uh, Marco Medenyak and uh, this is a Pepo and Castro, both at uh, Ecole Normale in Paris. And uh, basically, uh, it's going to be based on this recent work, which is to appear in the physical regulator recent, uh, uh, very soon. Um, OK, so you might wonder by having this kind of title, maybe my uh, primary interest is in uh, TT party form stuff uh, instead of uh, <clears throat> kind of a transport or out of equilibrium physics. But uh, actually the, um, the original intention of us, uh, ours was that uh, we wanted to study something um, about the transport phenomena, especially the um, kind of universal nature of diffusion. And then we thought of uh, trying out some uh, very simple model, like um, some toy model, um, but then uh, we came up with this, you know, applying this uh, recently very uh, popular uh, TT bar the home conform field theories to understand the nature of diffusion. Uh, that uh, with the hope that this might this might tell us about the generic feature of um, the um, transport phenomena in in, in a generic many body systems. All right, so uh, that was the. Um, original motivation. So to make uh, it more precise, I want to remind you of <clears throat> what the um, diffusion is. So the diffusion, you might maybe not necessarily be so familiar with the notion of diffusion. So let me uh, illustrate a bit. So for example, in the pure diffusive case, and when, in particular, when you have uh, just a single component, uh, I mean, just a single conservation law, let's say, just for me to make things simpler. Um, if you start starting out with this kind of uh, initial condition, like um, an inverted uh, Gaussian, no, sorry, just the Gaussian kind of initial condition, you release that uh, system from that potential. And then what you see, what you observe is that um, as time evolves, the initial profile will just get uh, fatter and fatter. And this rate at which this uh, initial profile is spreading is controlled by the exponent uh, one half. Sorry, I think we don't see your laser pointer. No, like this? Oh, ah, yeah. So you don't see? Ah, okay, so, okay. Only when you write, I think. Yeah, I haven't been, I haven't been written anything yet, until yet now, so, yeah. Um, but I see the mouse, so if you use the mouse, maybe it's, I don't know. Yeah, I could use mouse as well. But, just, uh, it sounded like you were pointed at some particular part when explaining, but uh, probably I just. Yeah, I will try to yeah use this uh, Apple pencil to emphasize something. Yeah, the mouse Oops. works well as well. I think it's big enough. To see. So you see this, right? Yeah. Okay, okay correct. Um, right. But then uh, this uh, period diffusive uh, case is just uh, the simplest case. And in general, you have uh, on top of this uh, diffusive uh, contribution, but also you have a ballistic contribution. In that case, starting from the same initial condition like this, you, uh, you would expect uh, something a bit uh, different, which is that uh, having this initial condition that would split into half and then they go undergo some uh, ballistic uh, propagation like this as time evolves. And this uh, 
sorry, but just you like, uh, can you clarify this term ballistic? Because for me, I only know it from military movies. Ah, sorry, the ballistic mean, meaning that it's just uh, this uh, initial condition, sorry. Uh, this is sort of density profile, as you wish. And uh, this will propagate in space, which is just the one dimension here. And by saying ballistic, it means that the, this, uh, it will propagate with, uh, with being uh, linear in time. So this is uh, what I mean by ballistic propagation. So, and then this it's, ballistic- Sorry, can, can you use a proper pointer? We don't, when you underline a word, we may not be able to see it because it, it doesn't- yeah, normally on this node, there is a laser pointer, you know, which doesn't- On the, on the top right, above a- So- uh, No, no, if, no, if you use your Apple Pencil- Yes. If uh, on the top of the, uh, on the top of your iPad- This one? This one, yes. It's easier if you mark with that. It's much clearer than if you just- Oh, okay, so if you underline in the X or so on, and it's not very, it doesn't pop out the eye. Sorry. Okay, okay no problem. So, okay. Can you Prefer. try it because we still don't see it? Oh, yeah. You just like paint with it as with usual marker, just it disappears. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, okay, maybe this is better. I mean, I thought. Uh, like another minor uh, feedback if you don't scroll it up and down because uh, just getting a bit dizzy. <laughs> Mm, I see, I see. Yeah, no problem. Okay, good, got it. Um, oh, all right. So yeah, that is what I meant by a ballistic propagation. So it's just a linear in time. But then that that would be in general uh, decorated by the diffusive correction. So this uh, ballistically propagating uh, uh, wave packet, so to say, is now experiencing the kind of uh, uh, I mean it's it's spreading out in the space with a rate that is slower than the ballistic propagation, which is now t to the one half, which is the same as the pure diffusive case. So this kind of combination of ballistic and diffusive transport are in general what you expect. Of course, in one dimension, maybe some of you know that um, uh, super diffusion instead of diffusion is uh, also uh, quite ubiquitous. And so by saying super diffusion, what I mean is that this rate <clears throat> of uh, uh, spring, spreading out in the space is now replaced, not one half actually, but replaced with a, <clears throat> uh, a bit uh, faster rate, like um, two third, which is the KPZ exponent. Um, all right, but I, uh, in this uh, project, what I'm primarily interested in is a diffusive, diffusive case. So uh, that this combination plastic plus diffusive correction would be the, uh, the cases I would be interested in. All right, so um, there are a couple of good, yes. Yeah, so, so there's this picture left and right, what does it depend on? It depends on the dispersion? Uh, yeah, in general, it's a, uh, it's a model dependent. If the model has a non-trivial current, then it has a, like a, if uh, the, the system conserves the, it ha it's a, if it's a gas, um, Gaussian uh, uh, invariant, for example, I mean the spatial invariance, then uh, you have an interior current and you'd have both ballistic diffusive uh, uh, contribution to your transport. But if you have no such um, non-trivial current, then you just simply have diffusive correction in general. Um, is, it, is it right the intuition that, probably it's wrong, but um, the intuition that in integrable systems you would have no diffusions, like if I think of solitons, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, uh, yeah, naively you would uh, expect that uh, because of, uh, stable causal particles, plus propagation, blah, 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 you might expect, yes, no diffusion, but actually you can show that there is generically diffusion because, uh, I mean, in interacting the whole system, there is generically interaction and, um, and the interaction will be represented by a non-trivial phase shift, right? And that would uh, actually give rise to <clears throat> non-trivial diffusion and you can show that. So um, actually, yeah, contrary to our intuition, you would in general expect uh, diffusion, even in integral systems. Uh, actually, what, 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 what you miss in integrable system, usually what is said is that you miss dispersion because dispersion is compensated by nonlinearity. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, 
Yes, so the interval systems is, are characterized by yep, uh, just the no particle production, so no diffractive uh, scattering, but uh, you still have uh, non trivial collisions that would uh, uh, basically be, be present in the um, interaction, and that would be responsible for diffusion. So it's a, it's a quite an anomalous diffusion, uh, sorry, anomalous mechanism of the diffusion that I admit, but uh, there is some diffusion that. Uh, this to be emphasized. Yeah, I mean, can I add something? I mean, there's a bit of yeah. confusion, I think, with uh, what was said, because there is a notion of a integrable hydrodynamic system like KDV. But mm -hmm. what you're talking about is completely different. You're talking about emergent hydrodynamics in many body integrable systems. Yeah, yeah. And so, in the latter context, you have actual diffusion. It's, it's very different from a wave propagating in KDV. It propagates like, like on the right picture or the picture on the right, basically. Right. So what? I, yeah. So so just to follow up on this, I, I wondered um, if I had integrable milk that I poured into my cup of coffee, would I be able to tell that this milk is integrable, or would it be exactly the same as any other milk? Oh, you, you'd be able to tell. Yeah. yeah. How? You just told me that there is diffusion on, on of many milk molecules. The that there are would it, would it be the same diffusion equation or a i mean what else can it be other than the diffusion equation on the macroscopic scale <laughs> there are infinitely many sound modes but maybe takato okay, will say more are you going to say more uh no i'm not going to talk mm. about this uh, right. uh, bit but yeah yeah there are many sound modes because uh, you have an infinite number of conservation laws in inter integrable systems so yeah um, you'd be able to tell so uh, you're saying that as i'm pouring this milk it would have these secret charges and and therefore, it would it would spread differently depending on which which combination of charges that I picked. Yeah, it, it uh, would, yeah. I mean, it would it would spread in very different way from standard fluid, let's say. Yeah. Wouldn't it just be the leading term? So you know, you would have the heat equation, and 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 you would just have or diffusion equation or whatever you want to call it. That there would be a coefficient for each of the modes, and then the leading one would be the only thing you would see. Um, not sure Sorry, maybe you... maybe this is not a. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there is some work we did with Takato in particular. When some <laughs> integral systems at low temperature, indeed, they look very similar to. I think you have put, uh, they look they look very similar to st standard hydro, indeed. Correct. So then you have some leading mode, and then it looks like standard hydro at, at very low temperature. But then, if you go to higher temperatures, you excite all the modes, and then it kind of looks very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was talking. I think I was talking, yeah, talking about yeah. There are good reasons for studying diffusion, and one of them would be that it's uh, related to chaos. I mean, especially in uh, in strongly interacting systems like a uh, system with the uh, many degrees of freedom, large and, and theories. Um, so getting to know something about diffusion might also um, allow us to understand something about uh, chaos. That is a uh, one good reason. Another reason is that um, recently we <coughs> discovered and also uh, Benjamin discovered that um, this, uh, how the diffusion in general, I mean, in even non integral systems can arise, uh, actually has a universal structure. So, which is, kind of reminiscent of how diffusion can arise in integral systems. So, um, so to say, even in a non-interval system, there is a, some sort of integral integrability bit in, as far as uh, diffusion is concerned. So um, there seems to be some universal uh, structure in diffusion. And um, uh, so this, uh, there's some contribution, universal contribution to diffusion that we recently uncovered, it should be just some uh, one part of the diffusion, and there should be other uh, contributions to the diffusion in general, I mean, non integral systems. So um, it would be also interesting to study these contributions. So motivated by these uh, reasonings, well, uh, there is a simple question we wanted to ask, which is, uh, can we understand the mechanism of diffusion in many body systems in a controlled way? And this was our uh, the starting point rather than uh, directly uh, jumping into the business of TT body format. Okay, so then how can I go to the next page? All right. Yeah. Is it okay? 
Good, yes. Okay. Um, right, so, but then initially we thought of um, studying 2D safety because uh, it's ubiquitous and also it's very simple and the com uh, computations can be done. Um, but then uh, immediately we, you know, you realize that um, it's not really a good idea, at least for our purpose, because uh, firstly, uh, to the safety, I mean, well, maybe in general, in higher D safeties as well, uh, there's no characteristic scale in safety, which means that no, uh, there's no notion of asymptotic particles. So in, in general, we, when we talk about scattering of the particles, you consider some asymptotic particles that are well separated, and then they undergo some bunch of collisions and eventually in the far future, there would be a, a gain far apart and this kind of a, uh, mental picture or uh, uh, kind of uh, that are involved in the scattering particles are not really possible in safeties. So, um, but this, that being said, actually there is a way out, which is to interpret a 2D safety as a master's limit of some massive interval Safeties. So uh, in this limit, you can sort of try to make sense of um, the notion of quasi-particles in 2D safeties. So you, you really treat them as like interval systems, but under some limit, massless limit. And this kind of idea was, uh, I think, introduced by uh, Bajanov and Lukanov and Zamolchikov like 25 years ago or something like that. So uh, this is the main idea that I'm going to use in this uh, in this talk and the, in the paper. And if you apply this kind of idea, then you immediately realize that the all the elementary excitations in 2D CFTs are just either right or left movers, and they don't really talk to each other. So, for example, if you consider right both right movers, then there is no way that they can scatter because they have the same uh, bare velocity and they go in the entire fashion. So uh, they wouldn't meet at any point. Same for the left and left movers. And on top of this, you also don't really have a scattering even between left and right uh, movers. So uh, by just invoking that diffusion in uh, integral systems are purely uh, coming from the collisions between the particles. You, you can immediately conclude that there would be no diffusion in 2D safety just because these elementary excitations would never uh, scatter. So uh, we are kind of stuck now. Uh, I mean, there's no diffusion, so what's the point of to studying 2D safety? But then there is, of course, we cannot simply abandon the idea. And what we can do is to try to modify this 2D safety in a, in a simple way. Like uh, you could uh, part of this. Uh, a 2D safety by a relevant operator, which would, in many cases, give rise to some massive integral systems. Or you could try to perturb a 2D safety by irrelevant operator. And this, uh, the latter uh, option is, uh, is, uh, is actually the TT part deformation. So if you choose that irrelevant uh, oper operator to be a TT bar, but more precisely determinant of Swiss-Nature tensor, then you'd get the TT bar deformation. And, um, and this deformation turns out to be a very good for our purpose because this deformation is precisely uh, going to do the job that we wanted uh, for, which is uh, introducing the scattering between the left and the right movers. So uh, this is uh, a good news and that is precisely that motivated us to study this TT bar deformed safeties to understand the transport. Um, okay, so that has been the kind of back to kind of the story behind the same kind of story. Okay, so uh, now this is the plan. I think uh, I kind of uh, have spent too much time on this introduction, but okay, so firstly, I will try to remind you of some very bas basic notion of hard dynamics. And then I will go move on to TT bar deformation. And uh, that these would be followed by some uh, discussion on how to analyze the hard dynamics of TT bar de uh, deformed safeties using the uh, 
BNZ and uh, and then I'm gonna apply these uh, ideas to study really transport quantities in TT bar deformed CFTs. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, hydro, uh, I thought of skipping this because uh, I'm not sure, I wasn't sure really how, uh, if this is really necessary to really understand what I'm going to do, but I, I think that this really cannot be skipped. So let me go quickly. Um, simply stated, okay, so firstly diffusion, uh, why I study, I mean, introduce hydro is just because diffusion is uh, conveniently captured by hydrodynamics. And uh, let me just simply write down hydrodynamic equation, which is of primary importance, this, uh, and which is this one. Uh, and this might not look so familiar to you. Uh, and uh, this having the, this, these indices wouldn't be helping either. But if, for example, if you focus on uh, conventional like a usual non interval systems with a, a few conservation laws, then you can re really recast these equations into the usual Navier-Stokes equation that we are hopefully familiar with. And here, uh, this A matrix and D matrix, curly D matrix, are kind of important. The firstly, this A matrix is called the linearization matrix. Um, okay, sorry, I forgot to mention that I'm considering uh, the linear response regime, just to make uh, things simpler. In general, these A and the matrices A and D are dependent on uh, the state, state dependent, but uh, just to make things simple, I'm considering this just a weak perturbation on top of some homogeneous state. So in that case, these matrices are just dependent on the background homogeneous state and now, which is just constant. So this linearization matrix is evaluated with respect, with respect to uh, uh, the background state and it's just a differential ratio between the current and charge. Uh, this diffusion matrix instead is uh, a bit more uh, intricate uh, quantity. And uh, in particular, we want to introduce uh, additional matrix out of this uh, diffusion matrix, which we call Onsaga matrix L by multiplying diffusion matrix and uh, susceptibility matrix defined in this way. Okay, um, and the reason why I introduced this Onsaga matrix is just because this is uh, something that's actually simpler to compute, at least uh, using the technology of interoperability. Um, okay, so um, this Onsaga matrix controls the diffusive broadening of the fluid packets. For example, um, you could generically expect that this, uh, this kind of uh, correlator, which is the second moment of density density correlation function that I define as um, like this, matrix S. Um, and this leading term is uh, controlled, it's, uh, it's uh, coming from the ballistic propagation the contribution from the from the ballistic transport, you can see that by just, uh, for example, uh, dividing both sides by t squared. And if you take a t to the infinity limit, then the only contribution coming from the left-hand side, I mean, the contribution from the integral is only um, those that are around x, uh, uh, that is more or less same as t. So only ballistic uh, uh, contribution that you can immediately see that. But um, if you want to focus on instead uh, the diffusive broadening, then you, you have to subtract this ballistic contribution from both sides and you divide it by T and take T to the infinity. And then you get the Onsaga matrix. Alternatively, you can express these, these guys in terms of the current current correlation function like this. And um, this uh, kind of way of expressing might not be so, uh, quite common, so you might prefer to have in this kind of expression state, which is the conductivity. So the conductivity can also be written in this way when the omega is uh, so this small. Just to clarify, when t is large, then it's a ballistic region which dominates. 
Uh, yes, uh, when T is really, really large, then yes. But so D is a ballistic or diffusion? Yeah, no, the, uh, sorry. It's uh, this, there are one D, which is the curly D and the normal D. And this normal D, which we call druid weights, is controlling the strength of the ballistic transport. Mm -hmm. So that's the term which wouldn't normally be present in like non integrable one. Uh, indeed, yes. Uh, this would be con uh, yeah, characterizing the ballistic transport, which are not <clears throat> so often found in the non integral systems. So, yeah, this is a kind of hallmark of integral systems. Um, okay. So, um, right. So, this on saga matrix or diffusion matrix is uh, in general, rather hard to compute. And that's why people appeal to like numerical simulation or other things to compute this diffusion uh, matrix. But in the integral systems, you can do it. Uh, it was uh, discovered by uh, Jacopo de Nardis, uh, Denis Barnard, and Benjamin Doyle. Um, and I'm going to apply this idea coming from the uh, interval study in the integral systems. Okay. So uh, now it comes to uh, TT bar deformation. I, I guess you, many of you actually know already about the TT bar deformation. So let me just uh, pick up some very basic stuff. So TT bar deformation is simply defined in this way by just incrementally adding determinant of stress energy tensor to the Lagrangian. So that would generate a flow of um, Lagrangians parameterized by this deformation parameter, starting out from the seed QFT. So in, in our case, this seed QFT is just some, uh, some CFT. And uh, TT bar deformation is also interesting from the condensed matter perspective because uh, it characterizes the physics near the zero temperature criticality, also along with other irrelevant operators like T squared or T bar squared. So it, it has been known that, um, for instance, in the weak coupling limit of the interacting baron fermion, for example, you, uh, I mean, the weak coupling limit of this system is characterized by um, TT bar deformed um, critical Ising model. So it's also uh, quite uh, ubiquitous in condensed matter systems. Uh, but um, what is fascinating about TT bar deformed uh, uh, CFTs or in general TT bar deformed QFTs is that it has such a nice structure and solvability. Um, one characteristics uh, characteristic is that um, the finite volume energy uh, eigenvalue satisfies, turns out to satisfy the Burgess equation. This is true for any TT bar deformed QFTs, uh, which can be written in this way. So if you know the spectrum of the seed theory, again, in your case, CFT, then you can expect, uh, I can calculate that of the deformance theory by working out, I mean, solving this equation. Of course, that is a non-trivial task, but uh, in CFTs, you can do it. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, I, I'm wondering, since TT bar deformation is irrelevant, so why would it affect thermodynamics or hydrodynamics? which means you take the system size to infinity. I guess then in that case, uh, the eigenvalues of energy would remain the same, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, but uh, we keep, uh, indeed, but uh, this, um, eventually we take, uh, yes, an infinite volume limit, but we take a uh, temperature uh, to be finite. And this temperature can be um, kind of thought of as a volume in that, um, um, by changing the, I mean the, the channel you're looking at. I mean the system you can be can be looked at uh, from the two sides, right? In the interval, sorry, in the relativistic system. So and the, in general, TT bar deformation changes the, or maybe more in generally, um, irrelevant operators change the UV property of the system drastically just because it's irrelevant, and that would be, I mean there is no reason why we why we shouldn't expect uh, hard dynamics or thermodynamics would be, uh, wouldn't be changed by the TT bar deformation. So in general, you expect that uh, quite a change would uh, be uh, generated by this TT bar deformation. 
Okay. In other words, you. what what you are saying. So if volume is large, spectrum is the same, but other characteristics which will be computed in a different channel will uh, will will change. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, right. But uh, yeah, that is a good point, and uh, because in the finite temperature free energy, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, you can actually relate uh, this finite temperature free energy in the thermodynamic limit with the finite volume uh, ground state energy, like this. And this is uh, actually important uh, fact that I'm using, because uh, I'm not really considering the finite volume uh, system, and the, I take always take thermodynamic limit. So uh, you have this kind of relation that, uh, which is quite neat. I mean, free energy of the interacting system can be written in this way is quite surprising. And you can already see by just looking at this that um, something strange is happening. For example, if you take sigma to be positive, then if you take this deformation parameter to be too large, or instead if you take temperature temperature to be too large, then this, the inside of the square root would be negative, oh, sorry, uh, which is quite uh, wrong. But this is quite well expected because it's, again, fervent deformation. It would uh, drastically alter the UV structure of the system. So high, too, too high temperature would be quite problematic. But you, if you, if you uh, narrow things down, I mean, if you focus only on the sufficiently low temperature, then that would be a problem. And that would, uh, that temperature regime would be something, uh, would be primarily what, where I will be working on. Um, okay, I didn't know that I could swipe like, like this, okay. Um, right, so this date has been about gen just just the generic properties of the TT bar deformation. But if you further focus on integrable systems, including uh, safeties, I mean, just by applying the idea of BLZ, then you could say something even more. Um, uh, so basically, okay, uh, this is an uh, integrability, I mean, a journal curve about integrability, so I, maybe I don't have to, uh, didn't Excuse need to write this. Question? But, uh, Excuse me? The first, yeah, sure. the first line, T bar, you have three pictures. I understand left and right. This is normal young back there. What's in the middle? You mean this one? Yeah, in the middle. Uh, the three point, uh, three, by the middle. three body collision. Uh, what's the expression for this, for this scattering mass, three body collision? Well, there are two expressions, one to the right, one to the left. You can choose. So two. this means that I can delete the middle, right? Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, yeah, maybe I didn't need to have to, yeah. Okay, right, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, all right, so, but just simply stated, the uh, interoperability ensures that you have an infinite number of conserved charges in your system and that would give rise to factorization of S metrics. Um, and a surprising fact is that TT body, what a TT body formation does to a uh, given integral system is that it just changed the two body scattering metrics in a very simple way, which is just, just multiply additional factor, which is often called the CDD factor, like this. So uh, if you know the system matrix of the original system, you multiply by this factor, and you get the two-body scattering matrix of the form theory. And that's as simple as this. Of course, uh, depending on whether you're uh, system that is being perturbed is uh, whether it's massive or not, uh, the CDD factor changes. If it's massive, then it's like this. If it's instead of massless, then it is like this. I mean, sigma of theta. Um, and here, this P, P plus minus, are just the momentum of the massless system, where this large M is not really mass anymore, but it's a kind of a mass scale that is characterizing the, the um, uh, crossover from infrared to ultraviolet. Um, okay, so now, again, interpreting a CFT as an interval system, like I said, there's no right-left scattering initially. 
But after this TT bar deformation, this TT bar deformation does induce a scattering between a right, right and left member like this. So now they repel each other, undergoing this kind of trajectory with this Fed shift like this. A caveat here is that um, in general, in, in a generic integral, local integral systems, uh, this Fed shift, I mean, this special shift are symmetric. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's uh, going this way or this way. But in this in, in this case, in this TT bar deformed shift case, it's a bit different. It's uh, this one is a sigma times P plus instead. And uh, on, the, on the other hand, this one uh, is uh, minus sigma P minus. I mean, having minus is just because P minus is uh, originally it's a negative number. So, um, okay. So this is a kind of what happens uh, if you introduce, a, I'm sorry, if you perturb uh, safety by TT bar deformation. And it doesn't matter if it's your system, I mean, if your CFT is uh, interacting or not. Um, all right. Um, so, so far it has been uh, kind of just equations and some bit of words, and you might uh, wonder what is uh, kind of a physical intuition behind the TT bar deformation. And there's actually a very nice way of understanding what, what's, uh, what the TT bar deformation is actually doing which is simply stated, it's uh, introducing a fundamental width uh, uh, to the particles in the origin system. And this point of view was advocated uh, recently by uh, John Cardi and uh, Benjamin. Um, uh, okay, so to have uh, intuition, you can, for example, consider uh, just the three classical particles on the line. Um, it could be quantum or classical, it doesn't matter. And then you do a TT bar deformation. And what you see is that these guy, these bunch of particles now acquire uh, with this, like this. So it becomes like a uh, rod. They are elongated and becomes a hard rod like this. Uh, you could really uh, work out uh, the computation in the classical case or uh, uh, quantum case as well. And you could really see this kind of uh, uh, picture. Um, uh, right. And the same thing was also uh, observed in uh, in a work, recent work by Ben uh, in the context of a TT bar deformed lip integral model. And also a similar phenomenon uh, was uh, observed in our work uh, in that um, at the level of hydrodynamics, you can really uh, interpret the dynamics of uh, TT bar deformed safety as a uh, hard dynamics of uh, some particular cellular automotive model called the Rule 54. And uh, I will come back to that later, but um, uh, for now, there are some known examples that um, um, <clears throat> that tell you that this kind of picture is actually quite ubiquitous. Um, and this uh, um, way of interpreting TT bar deformation is also consistent with the known fact that um, TT bar deformation can be uh, understood as a state dependent coordinate change. So uh, you can see that uh, TT bar deformation does uh, introduce, I mean, the, um, I mean, the effect of it can be replaced by changing the coordinate in this way, which is state dependent because this E uh, smaller means meaning that it's a uh, it, uh, total sum of the energy uh, left to the uh, the system. Uh, I mean, the left compared to the, the point at which you are performing this coordinate uh, transformation. So it ha has to know all the uh, thing what is going on in the, on the left to the uh, to your coordinate you're looking at. So it's a really state dependent coordinate change. Um, all right, and this uh, in this new coordinate or more uh, equivalent to the metric, you can uh, understand that the free space uh, in which particles are uh, exploring are can, um, 
are either reducing or increasing under this uh, TT bar definition. I mean, this uh, reduced, the reducing or increasing really depending, just depending on the sign of the deformation. I mean, it could be taken uh, negative or positive. It's up to you. And for example, if you if the deformation parameter is um, positive, I think, yeah, positive, then you could see that it, uh, it, uh, it gives, basically gives rise to uh, giving um, hard core repulsion. I mean, having this kind of extra length to the particles. And this basically means that the space in which the, these these guys can explore explore are now uh, reduced, so they can now originally they could explore all this this entire one dimensional line, but now because of the TT bar deformation, they really can't explore the entire space, but rather this limited space. So uh, so simply stated, this emergence of scattering by TT bar deformation is uh, equivalent to the change of the free space. And this kind of um, way of understanding is, I think, very helpful in understanding in general what uh, TT part deformation is really doing. Um, okay, and this uh, somewhat the similar idea. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, so Dekak, uh, yeah. could you? Uh, so this uh, interpretation for which sign is it? Is it for the one? Related to Nambugoto or the one? You mean this, the having the with the student. Yeah, like, could you relate it to like these two signs are associated to other things? Like one is, is a um, cutoff. What, uh, which which two signs? The, the, two, the two signs uh, of the deformation. Uh -huh. Which one is the one that gives the hard road? I think, yeah, I think this is a positive, if I remember correctly. And if it's negative, then yes, it's a bit not so intuitive, but rather it uh, it can explore um, additional space instead of a limited space. Um, so physically more uh, transparent uh, situation would be, I would say, to, uh, when the deformation parameter is positive because gives this kind of simple picture, but you can also make sense of the negative case as well by just saying that it can explore now a negative, I mean, extra space instead of having, exploring this uh, limited space. It's like a particle is going this way. And uh, if it's hard rod, then it's just uh, elastically scattered like this, right? Because it can't go farther. But if it's a permit deformation parameter is negative, then it can actually go deep in, in here. And then at, at some point it just simply like this. So, um, yeah, it. Uh, I guess, so I guess the second one is the one that seems to give like super luminal propagation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. One is so. luminal. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry. In terms of the time, we we should have a break more or less uh, now and then. Uh, for half an hour. Yeah. After. Sure. Uh, it's been actually uh, very. It's uh, unusual I have been spending time. I mean, I didn't expect this, so uh, yeah. Um, Maybe if you want to finish this slide and then we can have 10 minutes uh, break. Yes, uh, okay. Maybe I finish this slide and then yeah, we'll be going to the break. So um, having uh, reviewed some basic facts about TT bar deformation, uh, the last ingredient that is needed for this business is the generalized aerodynamics. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me be very simple. So, uh, generous hydrodynamics, which is, which goes by the name GHD, is just a hydrodynamic theory of integral systems. And um, so, hydrodynamics tells you that you've got to firstly write down an infinite number of uh, continu continuity equations or hydrodynamic equations, and you solve them self consistently. And you know, by by just merely invoking that. Uh, in integral systems, you have an infinite number of conservation laws. It's, it looks so hopeless to really, uh, you know, writing down all the conservation laws and solve the hydrodynamic equations. But uh, uh, there is a nice trick, of course, in integral systems, which is uh, to introduce a causal particle uh, picture. And um, we, you, all things, all the things you've got to do is to just rewrite these. Uh, charge average, charge density average, and current average. 
using the TBA, the notion of TBA, I mean, subordinate bed standards. So the first one, this has been known quite a while and uh, it has been also verified by uh, several people. What was new back in 2016 was that uh, you could also write down the current average in a very simple way, which is almost the same as the charge average. It's just um, with the only extra bit, which is the appearance of effective velocity. And you could also establish this uh, rigorously using some uh, variety of uh, methods. Now plugging these guys into these hydro equations and using the fact that this one particle eigenvalue h of theta uh, forms a complete basis of the L2 space, uh, sorry, complete uh, basis of it, then uh, you could immediately write down the GH equation. So hydrodynamic equation for integrable systems, uh, which is just a single equation, of course, at the price of having the extra continuum parameter as a momentum theta, but it's much simpler and it tells you much more about the hydro, uh, I mean, what, about what is going on in the hydrodynamics of integrable systems. And uh, yeah, it has a very, uh, there are just tons of related papers about it and also it has been experimentally verified. So yeah, uh, it's a very versatile tool. And that is uh, what I'm going to use. But okay, probably this is a good time to stop for a moment. And yeah, let's come back to 10 minutes or 20 minutes later. Okay. Okay, please. Okay, can I? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, right, so from this song, this slide on, I think uh, it's it, uh, new stuff. Uh, okay, maybe not this side uh, because, uh, okay, anyways. So uh, like I said, I will apply, combine some uh, multiple ideas like BLZ or uh, GHD or these things. And uh, before going into the GHD part, let me um, tell you how I, uh, We'll analyze TT body from the CFTs using the idea of TBA um, applying the BLZ. So BLZ allows, allows us to write down the TBA like nonlinear integral equations for CFTs like uh, minimum models or Lieber CFT. I think Lieber CFT is not really well known. I mean, it's not really well known that uh, you can apply BLZ to uh, Lieber CFT and uh, can say something about it. Um, and it's in general, it has, uh, it gives you a uh, nonlinear inter integral equations with uh, multiple uh, particle species. But uh, let me focus on the simplest case, which is just uh, uh, right, just two species, which are either right or left inverse. Um, if you want to, for example, do uh, minimum models, then you've got uh, additional indices here, like, uh, like XXT spin half chain. But for our purpose, it's not necessary. It just adds uh, additional complications. We forget about it. And this is an only entry equation that uh, uh, I'm going to use. So firstly, this is the pseudo energy. So um, I guess uh, many of you know what the pseudo energy is, but um, basically pseudo energy is uh, related to The Fermi factor, Fermi weight, as you wish. Um, so it's a, uh, it gives a weight of the probability distribution. And um, okay, so you could also uh, write down the free energy of your system using this um, pseudo energy. So having this equation, the first term in the right hand side. Uh, is the is the, the one called uh, source term, which is uh, giving the source. Uh, you could also put the additional higher charges in here, but I'm just uh, focusing on the simplest case where you've got just Hamiltonian and momentum in your uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble. 
I mean, you in your uh, state. This second term is uh, coming from the interaction in a CFT. So for example, if you consider a free CFT, then you, you, have, you don't have this term. This just goes away. But in general, you, you, your CFT has a non-trivial interaction like minimal models or a CFT. So you have some non-trivial bit here. <clears throat> and uh, this phase shift is a, a kind of a quantity that encodes the information of underlying CFT. So uh, the parameter is entering in this uh, in this uh, phase shift. You can uh, write down the center charge of your CFT, for example. This third term, uh, finally, is um, coming from the TT bar deformation. So, like I said, TT bar deformation induces a, a additional factor to the uh, two-body scattering matrix, and that. Uh, gives rise to this extra third term uh, in this pseudo, uh, in this uh, nonlinear integral equation. And this uh, uh, third term is uh, accounting for right and left uh, scattering, and it just reads simply like this. Excuse um, me. Excuse me. But yes. the, this, this scan uh, T, uh, so it, it's just the phase shift or the, the derivative of the phase shift? and. Uh, does it depend oh, on- it's a, it's a, Sorry, on sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of abusing the yeah, terminology. So yeah, indeed, you're right. This is a derivative of the fifth shift. So- to and, this, and also to, to understand better what you are saying, sorry, but it, 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 is this more a TBA? So it, it's really a TBA. So that, that well, although, yeah, there could be a little bit of mixing. Uh, so it, it's really yeah. TBA equations as, as far as I understand, so not a, a, a nonlinear integral equation. Somehow there are. Uh, so, um, well, I prefer to call it an linear integral equation because um, it's a. Uh, but they, they, they not they really the TBA on the real axis, as far as I understand, aren't they? Uh, yes, yes. This is uh, this is uh, on the real axis. It's not. Uh, yeah, axis. and and also t t quite quite usually depends on, on the difference. Now, uh, from what you wrote is, is more yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. you can write it as a theta minus theta prime. Of course, uh, uh, theta minus theta. So it, everything is uh, relativistic, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Thank you. And then you you have okay. only one type of quasi particles, no bound states or other. Yeah, exactly. No, no bound state. I'm just really focused on the simplest case, uh, like. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you want to consider minimal models, then you have to uh, uh, add the extra indices. So there, but, yeah. two pseudo energies, which which uh, inter uh, which uh, uh, interact somehow, no? E epsilon plus and minus only only two, as far as I understood. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, uh, pseudo energy for just the right and left universe. Okay. Uh, it's a system of two equations for two unknowns. Yes, two equations, exactly, just two okay. equations. Just okay. because just to, I want to make things simpler. I mean, this is true for, for example, for Luby safety, which uh, indeed have just the two equations like this. But uh, I, I, what I'm saying is that in general, you have to have a more, you know, uh, inter equations just because you've got the more particle species, number of particle species in your system. But the, it doesn't matter. I mean, as for what I'm going to do later, the number of the particle species does not matter. So for that reason, I'm focusing on the simplest case. Um, okay. Uh, right, so this is the nonlinear integral equation or TB equations. I mean, uh, I, I don't think it, uh, you, could, you could call it as you like. Uh, it's just that it comes from uh, the idea of Pajanov, Lukanov, and Zamochkov. That is uh, what I have to emphasize here. Um, so, for example, if you forget about the third term in, on the right hand side, then uh, this is just characterizing the pure safety. And you'd see that um, if you scale your um, um, energy scale, I mean, this uh, large M, like this, by just the some multiplicative uh, factor then it just merely shifts the rapidity, which kind of uh, <clears throat> implies the, there's no characteristic scales, which is in accordance with the fact that this got to uh, describe the differently for left and right movers. Huh? I'm sorry? Well, it shifted differently for left and right. Yeah, movers. yeah, it's a right and, yeah, exactly. They, uh, they shift differently because, yeah, 
uh, uh, e plus minus as a different uh, exponent uh, plus theta or minus theta. Uh, yeah, but it's just that the, the, the mere fact from this shift is just a shift in the theta to the bias uh, constant. So that is what I wanted to say. And um, you could also check that the pseudo energy determines the free energy of the system. And um, so you could, for example, reproduce the CFT result like this by focus taking the this kind of limit as sigma and the nu to zero. And nu is just a Lagrange multiplier for the momentum. And uh, sorry, Takato, just to make precise. So at the moment, this is like a, a universal to uh, NLIE. Uh, and uh, mm. you, you do not deform the hierarchy, you just have the Hamiltonian, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, Hamiltonian and momentum. Okay, uh, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. And uh, you might wonder if I'm missing the square in the beta, but uh, no, this is just a convention I'm using, using because I define the free energy in this way. Usually you have T here, but uh, I'm uh, ignoring that. So that, that's why we have no square in here. Um, this uh, F plus minus is a sort of a chiral free energy, if you wish. I mean, the free energy for right or left movers. And uh, it, it reads like this. There is no comment. Um, so so yes. the T plus minus is also the derivative of P left, P right, right? Uh, because. Uh, where is that? Uh, so in your definition of T plus minus? P yeah. plus minus, yeah. This Should one, it yeah. be the derivative of P left times P right? Uh, so it, I'm putting this in the, the measure of the integration. So yeah, it's a. Uh, oh, the equation is T plus T minus. So is, is in, the, the, in the blue. Coming line, from T D D factor. So it should be the same ah, ah. way as t defined with derivative of log rather than just. But yeah, log. but uh, yeah, and then I yes, think yes. p plus p minus p plus times p minus is the phase, right? So uh, so yeah, so log is taken correctly, but derivative uh, is absent. Right? No, no, this is. Uh, or is it? I think this is correct. Um, so okay, it's yeah, true yeah. that this is a differential phase shift. Yeah, yeah, and this should be correct. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, sorry for the confusion. So <clears throat> I shouldn't call these guys a phase shift, but uh, yeah, derivative of the phase shifts. Um, all right. Um, so now uh, it's time to apply these uh, set of ideas. So <clears throat> the first thing to do is to compute the effective velocity because if effective velocity enters into this GHD equation and it characterizes the hydro velocity of the each causal particle and this is important to uh, compute. And um, in general, it's uh, hard to get the closed expression for it of it, but um, in TT bar deformed CFTs, actually, you could uh, write down write it down in a very uh, concise way. And to know that uh, to uh, compute that, you first have to rewrite this uh, nonlinear integral equations. I mean, this guy's the equation for the pseudo energy in this way, um, which is easy to realize because this third term coming from right and left scattering is now something that is quite related to uh, free energy, I mean, color free energy. So you immediately see that you could rewrite this equation in this way. And now you see that, ah, this is nothing but the same as the TV equation for the pure safety. The only difference is that this this, uh, this factor. So, uh, which immediately implies that this is true. I mean, this uh, pseudo energy, a very, uh, that is evaluated with respect to uh, sigma equals zero uh, is now same as the uh, the full pseudo energy upon replacing the theta with this uh, shifted uh, uh, theta. So uh, using this fact, you could actually uh, write down the functional functional relation for the color of energy uh, in this way. It's, uh, it's 
actually very straightforward, which can be solved immediately. And uh, it gives like this. So uh, this is now you see that this is consistent with the solution of the Bogars equation. So, uh, uh, so far it's uh, all as we all expect. Um, and now uh, having this equation, what you have to compute is the dressed uh, derivative energy and dressed the uh, derivative of momentum. Um, and there's a nice trick. So in the TT bar deform CFT, E, I mean, energy is basically the same as the prime, I mean, derivative of the momentum. And likewise, momentum is the same as the derivative of the energy. So using this fact, you could base, you could write down, um, sorry, you could immediately observe that um, even after the dressing operation, uh, these guys should be the same. And this dressing operation, uh, I didn't uh, write down the uh, definition, but um, it, uh, I think it suffices to say that, for example, dressed momentum can be written as just the derivative of the cylinder energy with respect to the Lagrange multiplier nu. Um, and also, uh, dressed p, uh, sorry, dressed uh, derivative of momentum, it's the same as the dressed energy, and it's just, um, again, the derivative of the pseudo energy with respect to now beta, not uh, nu, because beta is the Lagrange multiplier that is associated to energy. And now you could then conclude that these addressed uh, derivative guys satisfy these uh, integral equations. Um, and, and from by just looking at this, you see that um, these, these guys are basically the same. I'm satisfying the same equation. Only the difference is that this uh, source term, I mean, the, the term that is driving this integral equation are different. So from this observation, you could uh, say that actually effective velocity, now here's the definition, effective velocity, which is defined in this way, which is the differential ratio of the dressed uh, energy, derivative of energy and dressed uh, derivative of momentum is stated independent. Because just because they are basically satisfying the same integral uh, equation. So this is quite surprising. I mean, in general, in in the usual interact sorry inter integrable system, this is uh, always a theta dependent quantity. So each causal particle with the causal momentum theta propagates with a different uh, effective velocity. But here, what we observe is that despite of having non non trivial interaction, all the causal particles are propagating with the same velocity. Oh, of course, it, uh, I mean, it, uh, for right movers and left movers, uh, they are different. But uh, apart from that, all the causal particles are going with the same velocities. Uh, sorry, the sorry, effective but velocity. This statement was before, right? When you was discussing these two branches deforming uh, from light cone to deformed light cone. This is just uh, this line, right? It follows this line. Uh, from yeah, like which line of configuration of TT bar, uh, right? You, or, or no? Well, you have no, no, this, curve. this curve, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a few slides ago. Uh, like when you have Even like uh, this light cone branching before, maybe. Yeah, this one. This on the top. Yes. You mean this one? All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, but then this is, a uh, again, I mean, this phase shift, I mean, no, I think it's correct to call it phase shift. This is theta dependent, right? So yeah. why do you, then do you expect that they are, the effective velocity is uh, theta independent? I, I don't, at least I don't see why it's obvious that uh, effective velocity is theta independent from just from, by looking at this oh, picture. No, okay, sorry, I confused, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh yeah. Uh, what what will happen when you send the deformation parameter to zero in your in your final expression of the effective velocity you just showed? You mean this one? 
Yeah, it would be the same thing. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it just uh, comes back to plus or minus one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and because that's a pure safety limit, and in the pure safety, effective velocity is, uh, I mean, there's no dressing whatsoever, so it just keeps the same bare velocity. All right. Yeah. Um, and also, I think it's important to emphasize that. Um, so, so the question is, what is the specific velocity? I mean, simply stated, this is a velocity uh, of a uh, quasi-particle that is propagating over a large distance and time, so which is hydrodynamic scale. So this is uh, not uh, something microscopic. I mean, this is a uh, average velocity after the pro some quasi-particle propagating uh, long distance and time. But still, it's uh, on a sufficiently coarse grain the spacetime, the the fact that the quasi particles are propagating with a constant velocity is, I think, uh, um, yeah, somehow surprising. And this gives rise to a very important uh, uh, ramification, so to say, which is um, which is that um, now. Firstly, effective velocity is theta independent, but on top of that, you can write down this effective velocity just in terms of uh, chiral energies. So here, rho plus and rho minus are defined in this way. Um, and you could also write down, they, uh, write down this, this guy um, using the energy density or momentum density and also uh, the average of the momentum current. So just uh, some uh, basic quantities. So this is um, very simple. And uh, in thermal case, uh, so just uh, having just having Hamiltonian in your uh, ensemble, you, you see that this effective velocity is just very simply given in this way, which is, um, I think this, this fact itself is, uh, has been known for a while, even from the work by uh, uh, Mark Mezai and the uh, other people. Um, okay, but now this is uh, some, now this is an important point. So the fact that effective velocity is written in this way, uh, not only being theta independent, but also written just in terms of these guys, actually means that the harder equations for the chiral energies decouple from the rest. So the chiral, the harder equations for the current energies satisfy this equation, this harder equation, uh, with this uh, relation, I mean, this effective velocity, which is again now just dependent on the, the, the current energies. So, setting another way, this harder equations evolve self consistently without referring to other dynamics of other higher conservation laws. So, um, these uh, hydro equations for the current energies are uh, also the same, I mean, the equivalent to uh, two equations for energy and uh, momentum. And uh, the point is there are other towers of uh, uh, hydro equations co corresponding to the higher conservation laws, but uh, in TT bar deform safety, somehow just these first two equations, they couple from the rest and they just evolve uh, self consistently. So, um, this is quite a characteristic of uh, TT bar deformed safeties, obviously. And uh, in general, in integrable systems, you wouldn't expect something like this. And um, hydro equations uh, mix each other very non trivially. And uh, that's why this hydro equation parameterized by theta is so useful because this allows you to. Uh, treat each conservation law on equal footing. Um, okay, and now this hydro equations uh, with this uh, effective velocity is actually something that is that also appears in the context of uh, hydrodynamics in a cell automaton system called the Rule Fifty Four. So <clears throat> I don't really think uh, this rule 54 is such a famous um, Question model, so. Rule 54, so this cellular automata 54, this is classical cellular automata, right? Is it? Exactly, yes, yes. 
Okay, thank you. So, um, so the cell automata model is uh, simply stated, it's a, it's a lattice system, um, which is evolved by not a Hamiltonian, but uh, the dynamics of it is characterized by a sort of a repeated um, action by some uh, some Floquet operator to it. So it's a, it's a kind of Floquet dynamics instead of Hamilton dynamics. Um, but still uh, the dynamics of the serial automata, uh, sorry, root 54 is characterized by some solitonic scattering of the, of the uh, elementary excitations. So this model is known to be integrable. I mean, I think the full algebraic structure of it is, uh, of it is uh, not so well known, but uh, the fact that it's integrable is, uh, I think, uh, established. Anyways, so the point is, like I said, the solitons are the kind of uh, uh, excitations in this uh, cell automata model. And you can uh, accordingly write down hard equations for the solitons in the root 54. And you see that, what you see is that the hard equation of the root 54 is precisely the same as this hard equations for the TT bar deformed surfaces. So now you can kind of build the- uh, Could I ask, uh, so how does dependence on X enters into this effective velocity? Um, effective velocity in here is now, uh, so the dependence is coming from the, this Lagrange multipliers. So this uh, effective velocity is now dependent on uh, rho plus and rho minus, and these guys now depend in, depending on uh, the Lagrange multipliers. And in, the, in, the, in, the, in hydrodynamics, Lagrange multipliers are dependent on the space and time. So yeah, that's where it comes from. So sigma is fixed, uh, right? And draw is a function of x, which you will find exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, yep. So <clears throat> now, at least at the level of hydrodynamics, you can say, then say that energy contour of TT bar deformed swifties uh, can be identified as the uh, solitons in the real 54. And this is, of course, not. The same as uh, not same as saying that the thermodynamics of these systems are the same. I mean, obviously they are not because uh, TT bar deformed CFT is in, defined on the KFT while uh, the 54 is on the lattice. And, uh, and there's a restriction that uh, no um, two uh, solitons that are propagated in, uh, in, a, in the parallel fashion, uh, I mean, they, they cannot really go closer than the unit lattice lengths because just because they are defined on lattice. So there's a kind of a construct, uh, restriction on the dynamics and that gives us to, I mean, clearly different thermodynamics of these two systems. Um, but hard dynamics is the same. So this is a, a kind of interesting uh, aspect. Um, all right, so this uh, TT bar deformed safeties, I'm sorry, Hydrodynamics of uh, TD by default safeties are char characterized by this equation. I mean, as far as the first two conservation laws are concerned. And this equation actually appeared in a different context before when people wanted to study the dynamics of the soliton beams of the KDV uh, excuse equations. Me. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what is, I mean, in the CFTs, you have this uh, uh, inverse temperature beta, but what is the beta in in this uh, row 54? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. So the beta in row 54 shouldn't really be understood as an effect, uh, sorry, if in temperature, but rather it's just a Lagrange multiplier associated to um, the total density of the, of the row 54. So you can of course define total density uh, in the root 54, and this is obviously a conservation um, concept quantity. And this should be basically identified as the Hamiltonian or the, I mean, energy in, in the TT part from the I, I see, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so what I was saying is that actually the Riemann problem of this hard equation, I mean, Riemann problem, meaning that uh, uh, 
starting from some um, initial system where you have two subsystems with the same uh, model, but uh, thermalized with respect to different temperatures. I mean, uh, they are joined together at some initial time and then uh, evolve, let evolve uh, entirely. And this kind of, uh, kind of uh, out of equilibrium physics of this, uh, uh, the equations uh, was studied uh, in a co completely different context. So we could actually borrow the solutions that are obtained by these uh, the people who studied such a uh, problem. You could of course uh, solve from the scratch by yourself, but uh, just that the, this kind of problem was worked out before. Um, okay, so this is uh, what I'm talking about by saying a Riemann problem. Maybe this is uh, not clear. So starting from the initial condition, having a step in a condition if you wish. And then you just let evolve like this. And what you see, okay, starting from a pure safety case is that you just observe uh, a sharp light comb enumerating like this from the very beginning of this, uh, the, the joining. And this is uh, what all that happens in a pure safety case, which is not, not so spectacular, it's very simple. Uh, and in general, if you do a uh, perturbation or add the interaction to the, um, sorry, not the interaction, but well, okay, uh, moving away from the criticality, then you wouldn't expect such a simple uh, structure of the of the uh, uh, Riemann problem. But what we found is that uh, by sorry, solving yeah, the so you could decode the, uh, the picture. So you start from initial condition where the sum of densities is fixed uh, to the right and to the left uh, for to be different constants, right? Is that correct? Uh, not some of the densities. It's just a different uh, temperature. I mean, the, having the same, yeah, having so different and temperatures. What, what is yeah. the initial density then? Zero plus or minus? You no, no, uh, and uh, rho minus. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the initial density. Is just a rho L. It's a fixed one number, of course, and here it's a rho R. So it doesn't um, depend on theta. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. It does not depend on theta. No, no, it doesn't. It's just a fixed density for any uh, for each conservation law. I mean, this is for the energy density. You could also have a uh, sure, conservation laws are fixed by thetas, right, and enumerated by thetas. Yeah, yeah, it's a different, it's, a, it's integrated over theta, of course. Yeah, it's because uh, the total density. So, yeah, okay, I think, okay, I got it now. Yeah, yeah that's what you're saying. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the total density. Um, and what you uh, realize by solving the Hydra equation is that this flat constructor is actually not so changed by the inclusion of the TT bar uh, operator. It's what happens is that it just shifts a bit. It's just the shape of it. It's just, uh, it just changes only slightly in this way. The, the, the fact that it has a sharp light cone like this does not really change, but the light cone, what changes is the light cone velocity. So it's not plus one or minus one anymore, but it has a, it depends not trivially on uh, the temperature or initial uh, Lagrange multipliers of the system in this way. So uh, this is uh, again uh, surprising. I mean, uh, it's uh, a priori. I don't think we one can expect this kind of uh, behavior. I mean, the, oh, for this, example, if you do a yes, uh, is this the same? signal propagation speed that uh, people have also computed in other ways yeah yeah i think same yes I think so. yeah, yeah yeah same yeah. as this one basically uh yeah this one. Oh, all right so it's uh, yeah i think it has been drafted in uh, different ways before like holography or other ways um yeah so what I was saying is that, yes, you could uh, get this kind of profile by solving the hydro equations. And what we are interested in is the transport, uh, Ness current. So Ness is, uh, uh, stands for non-equilibrium 
uh, steady state. And um, so for example, energy current, this one can be computed exactly by solving the Hydra equation and uh, you get this kind of a nice uh, result. And this should be compared with the pure safety case, which was rigorous, rigorously derived by uh, Denis Barnard and uh, Benjamin Doyle, uh, which is, um, This one, so uh, compared to this pure safety case, it has just a, a few uh, kind of uh, changes. The overall structure does not really change. The first bit is that the, the effect of scattering coming from this extra amount, uh, the prefactor ERL, which is uh, given in this way. Um, another uh, effect of the TTPA deformation is that uh, now this Temperature is not really uh, bare temperature anymore, but it's more like a dressed temperature, if you wish, which is a kind of a consequence of the change of some thermodynamics. So this T2 that is now given like this. Um, so, I mean, and obviously, if you take a sigma to zero limit, then you reproduce this pure safety case as it should. You could also compute uh, energy and momentum through the weight uh, from this nest current. Uh, for example, energy disk, nest current, sorry, the energy through the weight is simply like this, uh, while the uh, momentum through the weight is like this. So here, uh, it should again be compared with the pure safety case and the resemblance is now more visible because in the pure safety case, uh, they've got a nice uh, formula like this, like this, and uh, this they should they are really the same as these these guys, apart from the replacement uh, that I mean the, this new, which is sound velocity should now be sorry not new but v. V should be replaced by the factor velocity in here, and this v is in the pure safety case it's a sound velocity and which which is often taken as uh, just a one. But depending on your system, I mean, underlying critical, uh, critical. I'm mean, sorry, microscopic, microscopic system, it could take uh, another value. But the fact is, uh, this V should be replaced by effective velocity, so uh, it's quite a kind of inheriting the same structure in the pure safety case. And um, you could also produce these same results from uh, holographic computations, but I. I think I'm pretty running out of time, so I should probably skip. I mean, we can come back to it if you're interested in later. Um, okay, yeah, we can maybe discuss after uh, after yeah, the yeah. end. If you want. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this is this this is the last part. So yeah, um, so this is a momentum diffusion that uh, we were uh, we wanted to compute. Um, so you could uh, calculate the. Uh, momentum diffusion. I mean, the first thing people might want to compute is the energy diffusion, but this is uh, trivially zero because of the Lorentz invariance. Um, so what you look at next is the momentum diffusion and you borrow a formula uh, obtained by um, these people, which is this one using the technology of the GHD. And um, what you end up with is actually rather remarkably simple which is just like this. And uh, the point I want to make here is that it's, uh, it's quadratic in sigma. I mean, the, the first, uh, so of course you can expand uh, it, this quantity in terms of the sigma and you can expand it, but uh, the, the leading contribution is coming with uh, uh, sigma squared. And this is uh, uh, what we conceive as a kind of a fingerprint of being describing the effect of scattering. Um, if this were instead uh, linear in sigma, then we will think of it as a consequence of the change of thermodynamics. But because this is coming with square, we take it as a effect of scattering. Um, you can also confirm this result by conformal perturbation. 
up to the second order. So you might ex wonder if this result is in inverse of any CFT. Um, but um, this is to be checked. Um, there is a indeed um, kind of, a, it, it's suggestive that it's universal, but uh, it would be nice to really uh, go to the higher order perturbation and really confirm that prediction. This quantity, I mean, also we try to calculate this quantity from holographic uh, holography just to, you know, compare the results and also see if this result is universal. Um, but it turns out that this is quite challenging uh, because in holography, what you can compute is not really on cycle metrics, but the diffusion constant, diffusion metrics. And uh, just to remind you, on Sagar. Or could I could I ask that? So actually, so normal holographic results are highly non-universal because they're very sensitive to high derivative terms in the gravity. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's the point. But then this integrability calculation and also safety calculation suggests that it could actually be universal. So, um, so that's yeah, it's quite so only particular kind of gravity theories could appear in the in the CFT side. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In the in a pure gravity case, um, and also as for just as far as the energy, uh, sorry, momentum diffusion is concerned, maybe it's it's universal, but maybe not for other uh, diffusion constant like a diffusion constant associated to the higher conservation laws. Or, I mean, at least definitely it's true that if you do include the matter, I mean. If you uh, include the, not the, sorry, so not the pure uh, uh, gravity, but uh, if you add the matter field, then of course that it wouldn't be inverse. I don't expect that. But the uh, universality might appear if you really focus on this kind of simple case. But I'm not sure uh, this is to be really confirmed. Um, so, so okay, what I was saying is that the uh, on saga matrix- Another question, so integrability calculation also based on quite uh, severe assumptions that you have only one bound state and uh, no other quasi- uh, uh, No, no, yeah, uh, it looks like that, but uh, what I, as I was saying, it, uh, I don't see that even if you have uh, multiple uh, particle species, uh, the calculation procedures do not change at all. Everything goes through. So, uh, in that sense, I don't expect that uh, having more particular species or not to, to change the story. I don't think that is the case. There is but also, it's true that. Sorry. So, yeah, there is yeah. also, if you use like Duster de Vega formalism, you always have like one universal equation for for every system, yes. right? So, so yeah. using that, probably you don't need even to worry about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, we could also use that. Uh, this 3D Vega equation, but uh, yeah, one can try actually. Um, but uh, yes. it still refers to rank one, you mean, uh, right? It just collapse in the, uh, the bound state. Yes, the effect of bound state is, yeah, that is actually not so trivial. And uh, yeah, you're right. I, uh, in the presence of uh, non trivial bound states, uh, could be different. But okay. okay. With bound states, then you can essentially diagonalize the TBA and get, get the TBA that includes appropriate uh, kind of a new degrees of freedom and which is of the diagonal form. And then you can do the, the whole process from that. Yes. Yeah. Like I, yes. Gordon, for instance, right? So that's. Yeah, naively. Yeah, yeah. I expect that. Um, I just have to make sure that every single step of this computation also goes through even if you have it. Um, I think, yes, I think, yes. Yeah, but that would be non-trivial, but uh, in principle, mm -hmm. we do. Indeed, I agree. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the last remark I wanted to make is that holographically it is challenging to compute because this guy on Saga matrix is now, um, the leading is uh, proportional to the sigma square and C sigma uh, squared. This uh, susceptibility matrix is basically linear. I mean, the leading is C proportional to center, sorry. Uh, yeah, center charge, which means that 
this guy, diffusion matrix is um, uh, the leading is uh, th uh, proportional to the sigma squared times uh, center charge. Meaning that when you take C to the infinity limit with sigma times C fixed, I mean, this is always, uh, should be always satisfied. I mean, the sigma times C fixed, this goes to zero. So in this holographic limit, which is large central charge limit, this diffusion constant basically goes to zero. So in order to cal calculate the subleading contribution, which is proportional to one over C, you have to do a gravity one loop computation. And as far as I know, I mean, this is just what I heard. It's uh, rather non-trivial. So it's interesting that integrability wise, it's so simple, but uh, holographically it's so non-trivial. And uh, uh, we wanted to feel we, we we will try to fill that gap uh, in the future works. Anyways, um, and this is actually what we uh, could expect, if you think of it, because TT bar deformation does not really touch horizon physics in that, okay, this is something I skipped, but uh, holographically what TT bar deformation does is to kind of put the CFD into, I mean, the into the bulk of the ADS uh, geometry. So the, the surface where the CFT is living on now is a bit inside of the ADS geometry. And, but this is quite far away from the horizon. And uh, invoking that diffusion in the holographic uh, uh, context is coming from the horizon physics. I mean, what is going on near the horizon. And this TT bar deformation wouldn't really do anything at all about the diffusion. And this is why if you take really center charge infinity limit, you see no difference. And the correction is very uh, minor. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, I said this last, but it, okay, this is uh, really the last uh, slide. Yes. Okay. How, how, how much uh, do you think? Just, just a few minutes, okay, yes, I'm good. sorry. <laughs> um, so, okay, after saying all this, actually uh, the universality of the uh, TT bar safety is uh, actually straightforwardly following from this, a simple observation, which is that this trace relation, which can be argued by uh, a few methods, which is true always whenever it's evaluated inside of equation functions, this trace relation, this immediately implies that this relation that is connecting uh, the several components of the stress energy tensor uh, should be satisfied for any safety because this trace, uh, trace relation is valid for any safety. So having this uh, relation and having these two first two hydro equations for TT body form safeties, you immediately see that these, these two hydro, the sorry, first two hydro equations close with the uh, having this uh, additional relation, which we often call equations of state. So from just this uh, simple observation coming from the trust trace relation, you see that, uh, I mean, you basically immediately obtain these uh, equations without, uh, I mean, bypassing all this mess of the integrability uh, thing. And this is expected actually from the fact that classically the first two conservation laws don't really mix with other bunch of higher conservation laws because even after the deformation, the stress energy tensor is simply like this and they don't involve any higher charges. I mean, this is classically true. So just be invoking that hydrodynamics basically tells you what is, I mean, about the classical physics, this kind of decoupling from the rest of uh, uh, hydro equations is something actually you can expect uh, very beginning before doing all these computations. So, but that said, uh, of course, mixed things would happen in the higher spin conservation laws and um, that would be highly non-universal, um, I guess, I think. Um, okay, so yes, uh, okay, let me finish here because the conclusion is just a repetition of what I have been saying. So sorry about, uh, uh, taking up this time, but uh, and thank you for listening.
Thank you. So uh, please let, uh, unmute and thank Takato for the very nice talk. Thank and, you. Um, so are there questions? Uh, can I have a question? Sure. Yes. Uh, hello, Takato. Thank you for a very nice talk. I hello. wonder if uh, there's anything you can say in higher dimensions. Uh, well, that I'm not really sure about it. I mean, I think I, what I know is that there has have been some attempts to generalize this DT part information to higher D systems, but um, I'm not I'm not really sure what is the current status of it and uh, how one can really, I mean, to what extent all these things that are known in the TT bar form CFTs can carry over to the higher D case. Um, and as for hydrodynamics, I mean, this the the method I have been using, GHD and all these are ex, is uh, are ex, exclusive for the you know interoperable systems. I mean, in one plus one dimension, so they wouldn't be applicable anymore. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure about higher dimensions really. Um, yeah, I mean, if I understood correctly, then I mean, not all of this, but in the calculation of the in the calculation of the um, energy current on the ADS side, it is um, um, it is equivalent to computing the uh, stress energy density. Yeah. So um, so yeah, in higher dimensions, I think it. Uh, I mean, the CFT side is hard because, as you said, we don't have integrability. But on the ADS side, I think it would be. It would be simpler, but um, okay. I okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. The energy curve. yeah, I see. Yeah, I think so. It's just that I don't know how to define the uh, consistent TT bar deformation in hard D. So, but I think people have been working on it. Yeah. yeah, I think there are proposals that are tailored to exactly to. Be, be very similar on the holographic side, as the um, mm -hmm. uh, long said. So, but do you know if uh, in higher dimensions, uh, do you know if it's possible to do an analytic computation on the ADS side? Mm. Okay. Um, Can I ask another question? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so your formula for diffusion, um, I guess, is the formula you would obtain by uh, projecting on the, on the quadratic charge format of the momentum. Is that, would that be the correct? Uh... Uh, well, yeah, you could also obtain that way, or you could also, like you did, you, know, you could also use the you know, form factor things to get this formula. But I mean, yeah, because, yeah, so this, because this is, um, the system just has essentially two modes. Right, so momentum and energy, essentially. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as Hado is concerned, but uh, as far as Hado, yeah. I was wondering if this is still true at the level of diffusion. Then, as you can just consider these two modes, so usually you'd have a, a, yes. a lower bound uh, diffusion based on that. But then here you just have an exact equality. Good question. Good question. I'm not sure okay. that I really not sure. But the, this simple formula really suggests that uh, it could be the case. But uh, I, yeah, what I can really safely say that is that at least at the level of all the hydrodynamics, they are the okay. enough, but uh, for the future, I'm not sure. There are other questions? Uh, maybe the couple one I can address. Uh, it, it, it might yep. be actually related to what uh, Nikolai and Benjamin were uh, trying to address before, but I just want to make precise uh, is that. Now, when you talk about this uh, BPS presence or non-presence and uh, invariance uh, with respect to them, uh, what exactly do you mean here? Because uh, in, you, you say these words because uh, you, you, this, this only is true when you, don't, you, you have this undeformed hierarchy, right? So you, this is essentially probably to what Kole was mentioned, you restrict a priori yourself to certain uh, uh, pure gravity uh, uh, models. Because uh, there are, actually, I understand there are many things could be coming. Like you would, uh, you can have Max, Ma Ma Maxwell uh, 
Kaplan and other, and then your statements about non touching the horizon, everything can, can, can be very fast spoiled. But when you say, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, when you say about this uh, balanced state uh, invariance, what, what, what exactly do you restrict yourself to? So, so what I was saying, uh, this balanced state thing is that, um, so uh, if you have an extra, so to say, degrees of freedom, like a U1 or uh, uh, charges, then uh, this uh, TB equation is basically, where did I write? Sorry. Before. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, acquires an um, additional equation that is accounting for that additional degrees of freedom. Um, and that is, um, that yeah. might change the structure, but uh, yeah. But is this but because uh, the G? Yeah. Sorry, is this yeah exactly because is this the I don't think. It, well, I mean, uh, when this diagonalization, uh, it might it might be uh, not. It is not possible always. I mean that you say uh, by, by this extra question Diagon diagonalization. I think what uh, Benjamin was meaning to say. Yeah. Um, On TV. Uh, yeah, I mean, diagonalization should be, it should be always this possible, right? Or... But I don't know what you mean by diagonalization. <laughs> so I mean, if, you, if you have a, a um, non-diagonal scattering matrix, you have to yeah. do the nested beta on that. So you have to kind of find the, the right momenta, but also the right uh, distribution of uh, particle types. It becomes kind of a quantum chain. And that you have to diagonalize as well. So you have a, and then what you get is essentially a new uh, a set of equations, which are thermodynamic better than that equation for that system. And in that, in these equations, you don't necessarily see the original degrees of freedom, like the plus and minus that you were seeing at the beginning. You see something slightly different. different. But the question but it will be a coupled system of nonlinear integral equations normally. <clears throat> yeah. That's the point. Yes. And, uh, yeah. But this will happen if what you say, right, uh, distri distribution could be found. Uh, yeah, I mean, so in principle, you can you can extract from that all the the physical variables that you're interested in. In principle, but it becomes complicated. I mean, these equations are usually complicated, and very often you have an infinite number of couple integral equations, right? And right. that's why then you want to do an LIE, which is much more. So you resum yeah. that. Uh, yeah, but even if you lucky to compress it to finite number, it uh, not necessarily there will be only one of them, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, right. But then at least you can have like for the classes of systems with, I don't know, SL2 symmetry, then that, that's already infinitely many systems. Yeah, yeah. For which then maybe yeah. you have other- Say principal Karel model. Change. Yeah. So, so here can I, so is, there, is this the, the case then here that we don't know if there might be bound state when we do this perturbation, depending on the safety, is that the, and so, and so well, not, I think in general, yes, but uh, for the examples I know, they are not having any bound states. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about it. Maybe. Um, but, uh, say, start from PCV. It has uh, many types of particles and uh, it does have CFT limits, right? When mass goes to <clears throat> what, zero, right? Yeah. Which model? Like O N model or principal Carroll model. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 principal. Yeah. yeah. But can't we assess presence of bound state by looking at the um, uh, analytic structure of the the S matrix that you find there? I mean, wouldn't that be sufficient? That's the point because the, the, there might be uh, certain backgrounds or what you want. Uh, what is called factorized backgrounds when the, this analytic structure is not explicit or you just don't know. That's what I tried to say. For example, even not going, well, maybe BTZ or something could be better related like ADS3 and the derivatives, but the uh, lower dimensional one is, is, is a big uh, open question. This is why I tried to establish this relation and this is why uh, the probably diagonalization, uh, what, what you are talking about is also a question what people try to, to, to go through what uh, Emira TBA to, 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 to compress it to a finite number. Uh, okay. Okay. Anyway, I think we are now in a chaotic phase. Should I stop recording?
<laughs> yeah, we can continue informally. Uh, 